The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Andy West and in today's episode we'll be building a cheat device for the Atari 2600. So what's a cheat device? Well, if you owned a video game console in the early 90s, then you may have also had one of these. This is called a Game Genie, and it lets you enter cheat codes that can temporarily modify games and give you infinite lives, invincibility, and lots of other effects. It was available for several consoles back in the day, but they never made one for the Atari. By the time the Game Genie came out, the 2600 was considered a budget console and was nearing the end of its lifespan. Well, today we're going to change that by using an FPGA to make our own Game Genie for the Atari 2600. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Before we begin designing our own Game Genie-like device, let's take a quick look at the original NES version. So the way this works is you take your game and you insert it into this end. Then you plug the whole thing into the Nintendo's cartridge slot. When you power on the system, you get a screen where you can enter one or more cheat codes. Then when you press start, the game begins with your codes activated. It may look simple, but it's going to take some work to replicate this functionality. So let's break the problem down into steps. We're going to use an FPGA since we need lots of fast I.O. connections. And the first thing we want to do is read the data off a game cartridge, so that'll be step one. Then we want to connect the FPGA to the Atari and fool the console into thinking a game's plugged in. So emulating a cartridge is step number two. Then we'll combine the previous two steps and make a pass-through device, similar to the Game Genie but without any codes. That's step three. And finally for step four, we'll add the cheat code logic and interface. In a previous video, I showed how to make a simple game using the DE0 Nano FPGA development board. For this project, we're going to use the same board, but in a completely different way. As you can see, there are two GPIO headers. We're going to wire one of these headers to a card edge connector that takes game cartridges. This diagram shows the pinouts for the Atari 2600 cartridge port. Those starting with an A are address lines, and those with a D are data lines. We'll use this along with the DE0 Nano user manual to wire everything up correctly. And here it is. We'll use a game called Dragonfire for our testing, and I'll explain why shortly. Now that everything's connected, we'll create a Verilog project in Cortis 2 that will read the cartridge data, but we'll need some way to prove that it's working. We'll use the Nano's eight LEDs to display individual bytes, and the two onboard tact switches will allow us to navigate forward and backward one byte at a time. This is all the code we need to make it work. Looking at the port list, you can see that there are eight bits of data, just like the pinout diagram showed. We have 12 address bits, but we separated out the most significant bit because it's used as the chip enable, and we're setting that to 1. Here you can see that the cartridge data is sent to the LEDs, and these two code blocks increment and decrement the memory address that we're looking at. The pin planner is where we configure our GPIO pins. Here we define the usual things like direction, pin location, and current and voltage levels, but there are also two other special properties that I want to mention. The first one's called PCI-IO. It's important to be aware that the Nano uses 3.3 volt logic, but the Atari uses 5 volts. Finding 5 volts to power the game isn't a big deal, you can see we're using the spreadboard power supply, but wiring the 5 volt data lines directly to the Nano's inputs could damage them. My first thought was to use a logic level shifter like this one, but then I discovered a feature called PCI clamp diode, which can be used when interfacing with 5 volt logic devices, so you can see I've gone ahead and set that for all the cartridge inputs and outputs. The other important column here is Fast Input Register. According to Intel, this helps maximize I.O. timing performance, and I found it was necessary to turn it on for the cartridge data lines, otherwise it wouldn't work. Now we'll compile and run our project. I'm hoping to see a bit pattern appear on the LEDs that changes when I press the buttons. Okay, so the FPGA is already powered on, as you can see, and the next thing we're going to do is turn on the breadboard power supply which will power the game, and the first byte of the ROM, uh, the bit pattern for that, is what we should see over here on the LEDs, uh, if it works. So let's give it a try. <laughs> okay, so it's working, it's showing a pattern there. I'm not sure if that's correct, but we will find out soon. 
All right, so now I'm gonna press this button, which will advance to the next byte in the ROM. And if the data is different, then what's displayed here will be different as well. So let's see if we can do that. And it looks like it's working. That is perfect. Just a few more to make sure. Okay. All right, now I'm going to press the other button to go backwards through the same data. And we should see the same patterns in reverse moving towards the beginning. And the first byte, it is right there. We're seeing consistent bit patterns here, which means we're reading data off the cartridge. But now we need to confirm that the values are correct. Fortunately for us, the source code for Dragonfire was released into the public domain by its author. So we can assemble the code into a ROM file and load it into a custom tool that'll display the same bit patterns we expect to see on the FPGA. I've compiled the Dragonfire code and built a simple Windows program to display the data. Pressing the left and right buttons in the program will have the same effect as the buttons on the FPGA board. Let's compare and see what happens. On the left we have the verification tool, and on the right is the FPGA. I've synchronized the video so that the button presses are happening at roughly the same time, and you can see the lights are showing the exact same patterns, so that means our Verilog code's working right. Nice! So it's great to see this work, but it only gets us halfway there. Next we're going to create a new project where we load the game into the FPGA's ROM storage and emulate the Dragonfire cartridge. Here's the board we're going to use to interface with the 2600's cartridge slot. This one has a hex inverter chip that we don't need. I don't care about salvaging it, so I'll just cut the pins which will make it easier to remove. Using a multimeter we can determine which holes on the board connect to which of these contacts. With that information we can wire up the address and data lines. Back in Cortis 2, wiring the I.O. is very similar to when we were reading the game cartridge. And in fact the code's even shorter because we're not handling button input. The data will be stored in the FPGA's ROM in a special format. Let's prepare the data by converting it to that format now. Here's another custom tool to convert Atari 2600 ROM files to Intel hex files. We'll run the program to convert the game to hex format, and then we'll go back to our Quartus 2 project. The ROM module is set up through the Mega Wizard plugin manager, so let's walk through it now. The Atari can address up to 4K of ROM, so a lot of 2600 games used that size, including Dragonfire. So we want 8 bits and 4096 8-bit words. Skip forward to step 3, and we can select the hex file we created to initialize the memory. That's it, now we can finish it. When we program the Nano, its ROM will be loaded with the binary game code. We instantiate our ROM in the top level module, and use the parameters to wire up the address and data lines. Ok, we've reprogrammed the FPGA, plugged the board into the console, and connected the power. With any amount of luck, when we run this the Atari will think that the FPGA is actually the Dragonfire cartridge. Here we go. <laughs> That's what I was hoping would happen. Ok, so it does work, but you can see the video quality is pretty bad. One thing I've learned is that the Atari is very susceptible to problems associated with dirty power, and right now I'm running the FPGA off a USB hub, so it might help if I use a regulated power supply instead. Yeah, that's much cleaner. We'll make sure to use this for testing going forward. Now it's time to put together a complete prototype, which means combining everything we've done so far. So I'm going to take this pre-wired board with the game cartridge from before and plug it back into the FPGA. And then since it's all one piece, we can power the game off the Atari cartridge port itself. That's how it was originally designed to work after all. Now let's dive back into some Verilog and get all this working together. There isn't much new going on in the code here, but there are a lot more pen assignments since we're now dealing with two separate memory buses. I made sure to double and triple check that all these are correct, because we don't want to damage any of the chips. Ironically, even though we've done a lot of work to get to this point, we should expect the game to play normally. It's not until we add the cheat code functionality that we'll notice any changes. Let's test it out! The game plays exactly like it's supposed to. So now comes the fun part. With just a few lines, we'll hardcode a cheat directly into the Verilog file. Actually, it's not so much a cheat code as it is a simple visual change to prove that it's working. By looking at the game code, I was able to see that location 1375 is where the color of the fireballs is set. Hexadecimal value 44 is a reddish color. And by changing it to 84, the fireballs should appear blue. Now keep in mind that we're not actually changing the code on the cartridge itself. That's read only. Instead, we're intercepting the request for code at a certain location and returning different code instead. Let's run it and see if it works. Awesome! Those are definitely blue fireballs. Or ice balls, I guess, since they're blue. Anyway, it works! 
Now we're getting really close to having Game Genie like functionality, but we don't want to reprogram the FPGA for every new cheat code. The Game Genie solved this problem by providing a native console interface, but there's no way we're going to write a bunch of assembly code just so we can enter codes with a joystick, right? Wrong. We're going to do it now, and I'm going to show you how. It used to be that you had to install an entire toolchain on your computer to make Atari 2600 games. This would include an assembler, emulator, and code editor at the very least. But now you can just go to a website that has all these tools rolled into one. The 2600 is notoriously difficult to program due to hardware limitations, so I'm not going to go through all the code, but I will show you some of the more important parts. Our device will allow up to three cheat codes, each five characters long. The Atari only supports two bitmapped graphic objects called players, so we use a well-known trick used for showing six-digit scores and just use the first five digits. There's very little room for error here, and if this routine is off by even one CPU cycle, it can mess up the display. The character values themselves are stored in variables in RAM, and by responding to joystick movement here, we manipulate those variables. Pressing up or down increases or decreases the current value, and left and right moves the cursor to the next or previous character. The cheat codes are made of two components, a three-digit address and two-digit data value. The digits are hexadecimal or base 16, but instead of using the symbols 0 through F, I decided to go with frequently used letters from the alphabet. Here's the mapping of hex digits to cheat code letters. Of course, the Atari doesn't have a built-in font, so we have to draw our own, including special characters like the cursor. Here's where all the bit patterns are defined. So we already know how to load a game ROM into the FPGA from our earlier experiment. And you can actually download the ROM image for our interface directly from the site. Plus, we know how to run code from both the FPGA ROM and the game cartridge. But we need a way to switch between them when the player's done entering codes and wants to play a game. We do this by handling the reset switch. When the reset switch is pressed and released, we jump to the code stored in locations FFFC and FFFD. This is the hard-coded reset vector, which tells the Atari where to start executing code when it's powered on. Our Verilog code needs to know when the reset switch is pressed as well, and it also needs to know what codes we've entered. But the data lines only go in one direction, from the cartridge to the console. So how do we communicate with the FPGA from our UI? Well, if you think about it, requesting memory from a particular address is a kind of communication. Since we have access to our assembled UI code, we know exactly where the cheat codes are modified. We also know when the Atari is trying to run code from that specific address. So, we can maintain our own synchronized copy of the cheat codes inside the FPGA. And when the Atari asks for the code in our reset switch handler, we know that it's time to stop running the UI and start running the game. This is a clever approach, but it depends heavily on our UI code routines being stored in a consistent location. If we modify the UI in any way, we need to make sure that the Verilog is updated to reflect the changes. Now for the moment of truth. Our UI came up, so far so good. We'll enter the same code we used before, and... The game starts, and the fireballs are blue, which means it works. Okay, before we get into more games, let's put the 3D printer to work. We've now shown that we can make a console cheat device with an FPGA, but it's a bit unwieldy to say the least. In the interest of time, I'm going to print a couple of freely available 3D models to make it easier to use. Here we've got a cartridge housing. This will be easier to handle than a bare circuit board. I've added a slot in the back to pass some ribbon cable through. Let's get printing. And this is a cartridge receiver. It has special tabs that are required to access the circuit board in some cartridges. I've wired up a replacement for our breadboard solution. Let's assemble everything and see how it looks. This is a definite improvement. Now let's find some cheats and try some games. The first game we're going to check out is Space Invaders. This is a classic. I played this a ton when I was a kid. So there's two ways to lose. One is to get shot three times by missiles. 
and the other is to let the aliens uh, reach the bottom of the screen, which ends the game instantly. So every time the aliens cross the screen, they advance closer to the player. This cheat code will prevent the aliens from moving downward, which eliminates one of the game's main threats. And one interesting side effect is that the aliens in the top row are much harder to hit. Look at how many shots it takes me to get this one, it's pretty funny. Next up is Dragonfire. Yep, we've seen a lot of this game already. You start with seven lives, you can see that um, represented by the icons on the bottom of the screen. Um, this cheat uses two codes and it gives you unlimited lives. So you can still get hit, but it only slows you down for a second. So as you get to the higher levels, the dragon moves faster and so does your player. And even with unlimited lives, this is a challenge. Look at that. Berserk is a fun game involving evil robots. At least I think that's what they are. Uh, you die if you touch anything or get shot. So this is another two code cheat and it makes you invincible to the robot's missiles. And this makes the game significantly easier, but you can still lose if you touch the robots or the walls, so be careful. The next one we're going to look at is skiing. Uh, this is a pretty fun game, I like it. Uh, the idea is you try to get a fast time on a downhill ski course. And if you run into the flagpoles or the trees, uh, you'll fall down, which slows you down a lot. So here's a pair of codes that allow you to ski right through the trees and moguls. And it looks kind of funny since the obstacles are drawn on top of the player. Um, and also you can still run into the flagpoles, so you gotta watch out for those. All right, the last game on here is Video Pinball. So I've always thought this was an interesting game because it has a sort of crude physics that most uh, Atari 2600 games don't have. Um, the standard game starts you with three balls, but this cheat will give you nine. Uh, here you can see we're on our seventh ball, which isn't normally possible. And actually it is possible to create a cheat code for more than nine balls. Uh, but since the display digits in the game only go up to nine, uh, it starts to render weird symbols. So I figured nine was enough for an extended game. That's all we have for today. Have you ever tried to hack a retro video game or console? How did you accomplish it? Let us know on the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash presents. We'll see you next time.